Welcome everyone to this evening's Zoom program, Making the Terrorists Pay, How Attorney Stephen Perlis Gets It Done. I'm Sharona Whistler and I serve as the Executive Director for the Zionist Organization of America's Florida Region. I wanna give a special welcome to our local and national board members and donors who are with us today and to all of my colleagues who are on the Zoom. A special thank you to my colleagues for helping behind the scenes with tonight's call Alan Jay, Director of Outreach and Engagement, Stuart Pavlak, Executive Director in Pittsburgh, and our Communications Manager, Jackie Schaefer. Thank you guys. I'm so proud and honored to work with such a dedicated ZOA team, not just those who I mentioned, but everyone. Our crucial work in Israel activism and combating against anti-Semitism, be it on college campuses, on Capitol Hill with our Government Relations Department, in the courts with our Center for Law and Justice is continuously relied upon and our incredible ZOA team is tireless. On a more personal note, I'm proud to represent ZOA because I know we'll always be unapologetic in our Zionism. On behalf of the Jewish people speaking. One second, I think I was just muted. Okay, everyone can hear me? Okay. Um, doing otherwise boldens Israel's detractors, undermines her standing in the international community and endangers her security. So ZOA's voice and all of your voices, involvement and financial support on behalf of ZOA is needed and very much appreciated. The topic of how our guests Speaker Stephen Perlis gets terrorists to, pay, terrorists to pay, spans the globe, and at the heart of it is unimaginable, unimaginable pain for victims and their families. Stephen witnesses this firsthand. He is the founder of the Perlis Law Firm, which specializes in private litigation against state sponsors of terrorism, which have included Iran, Syria, Sudan, and Libya. Additionally, the firm brings suits against large financial institutions that launder money for terrorist organizations. Steve's 40 plus year career has resulted in reparations for thousands of American victims of terrorism and their family members. He's a member of the International Council at Harvard University's Belfer Center, a trustee of Boston Symphony Orchestra, and we're very proud at ZOA to have Steve on the board of advisors of ZOA's Center for Law and Justice, directed by Susan Tuckman. Steve, I've said this to you before, I'm humbled whenever I recount what you've accomplished, and this is only a very brief summary. It is truly a privilege to have you back with us for another Zoom program. And I know I speak for all of us at ZOA when I say that we're grateful for your important and righteous work, and thank you for spending the time with us this evening. You know, Sharon, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure uh, working with you, the people at ZOA. It is a, it's a great organization and it's not an exaggeration to say, you, you want a little of my time here and there? Uh, and you almost never ask, but you want to borrow a little time or steal a little time, you are always welcome to it. You know, I, I, uh, I was sitting with a, virtually I was sitting with a, with a senator a couple of days ago and uh, you know i i described myself as a miami beach beach bum who accidentally over the last 40 years has taken more than three billion dollars away from the material supporters of terrorist attacks whether those be terrorist states or major financial institutions we are we are going to get to all of that <laughs> Uh, give a message to our audience to please keep yourselves on mute during the program. We plan to have a Q&A from the audience after the interview using the chat box feature. It's currently disabled, but we'll open it for questions um, in the middle towards the, the end of our uh, back and forth towards the end of this interview with Steve. And um, if you're worried about forgetting your question, just jot it down so that you can um, queue it up when the chat box is, 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 is enabled. So let's get started. As you were saying, 
you have successfully gotten payment for your clients from Syria, Iran, Libya, and others, which sounds to me like mission impossible. Focusing on the Prince case and the Plato case, can you talk about how you've gotten this done and perhaps give some background for those on the call who are unfamiliar with these cases? I, thank you. I'd, I'd be pleased to. Prince versus the Federal Republic of Germany wasn't a, uh, wasn't a terrorism case. It, it was a case involving uh, Holocaust era reparations, but for a very, very small and finite set of people. These were individuals who were in Nazi concentration camps while they were US passport holders. And uh, when the when Conrad Adenauer created the German reparations program, uh, all the people who were in camps uh, at, registered in as US passport holders uh, or US servicemen who happened to be Jewish, who got, uh, I'll put it politely, culled out and, and went to concentration camps instead of prisoner of war facilities, uh, uh, were simply disqualified from the German program. Uh, so the first case that, that we brought, and I guess we started in 1986, was reparations for this relatively finite set of um, Holocaust survivors. Um, and that program took about nine or 10 years, and eventually the, the, uh, the, the German government surrendered and, and um, uh, created a program for individuals who were U.S. passport holders or U.S. servicemen while they were in Nazi concentration camps. Uh, not long after we successfully concluded that program, I got a call from a gentleman named uh, Steve Flato. His daughter had been killed um, a few days earlier in an Iranian-sponsored bus bombing. This was during the Clinton administration, and it, the bomb, which was intended to kill, frankly, it was intended to kill American kids going to the beach in Gaza, which sounds so strange today, but, but in the 1990s, um, you know, during President Clinton's peace initiative, Gaza was a very peaceful place. And a lot of Israeli and American kids would get on a public bus and ride to the beach in Gaza. The Iranians put an end to that and, and um, uh, attempted to uh, successfully, frankly, derail the, the President Clinton's peace initiative by detonating bombs on buses that um, were known to carry American kids to the beach or to or from school or on, on public holidays. Um, and Steve Flato called me and, um, and said, Hugo Prinz lives a, lives a couple of uh, communities over from me in New Jersey. And I've been watching everything you did for him uh, over the last decade. Uh, the Israelis have told me that the Iranians were responsible for the bus bombing that killed my daughter. And uh, I'd like to know if you can do to the Iranians for my family what you did to the Germans, uh, you know, for Hugo Prinz and his family. And, and my first question to him was, you buried your daughter this morning. I, I said, you know, I've been watching on the news, 5,000 people showed up for your daughter's funeral. Why aren't you sitting Shiva? And, and, you know, and he said, she won't let me. You know, it's, I'm just hearing that voice. I have to call you and ask that question. I couldn't turn him down. Uh, and, and when we started, there was no remedy. Uh, but um, that worked its way into a statutory remedy. Um, at the time we started that case, the hard part was really learning how to get jurisdiction over terrorist states and terrorist organizations in the United States. That's become fairly regular, regularized now. 
um, the, the, real, the real trick is getting paid. You know, it, in the Prince case, there was a very fine appellate jurist who, who, who retired from the federal court system and went on to the International Court of Justice for, for quite a while, uh, named Patricia Wald. And her, in her uh, dissenting opinion in, in, in one of the two appellate court opinions involving the Prince case, uh, she invoked a doctrine called implied waiver in which she said, uh, at some point a foreign sovereign's conduct becomes so noxious vis-a-vis -a, -vis a US national that it has no expectation of immunity. And if not, uh, you know, the Germans putting an American citizen in a Nazi concentration camp, then when? And uh, several years later, when the Flato case came along, uh, Congress answered that question by codifying Judge Wald's dissenting opinion in what is now called uh, the Flato Amendment, uh, or sometimes called the Terrorism Am Amendment. And Judge Wald asked the question and the Flato Amendment answers it. And it says under what circumstances foreign sovereigns are subject to jurisdiction in the federal court system for certain kinds of noxious conduct committed against US nationals. And they are things like um, terrorism, uh, aircraft sabotage, hostage taking. Um, they all fit within the general error, uh, general rubric of uh, terrorism in the, in the modern world. And I, you know, I get credit. I got a Nobel Peace Prize nomination out of all of this, but so much credit goes to Steve Flato's bravery. I mean, he walked around Capitol Hill, sometimes with me, sometimes by himself. And, and uh, he met with President Clinton three times. And, and in the end, uh, he got the statutory change that we needed to drive Elise's case forward. The rest is history, frankly. I, I, Steve Flato really deserves a lot more credit for this than I do. Well, you, he, it sounds like he was certainly the, the, the driving force, but I'm sure not just him, but all the families that you've helped are so very appreciative to have that put in place. So recognizing that there's no one size fits all, can you describe the challenge of separating terror states from their money? Yeah. Uh, every terrorist state has, um, has a different style in, in which they try and combat this litigation. Um, let's look at, um, Let's look at Libya. Let's contrast the, the two, really contrast the two extremes, Libya um, and Iran. Um, uh, Libya entered the litigation early, contested the litigation vigorously, right up to the point of trial, and then said, let's have a timeout. We need to get this settled. And I spent, I don't know, three, four years uh, negotiating with the government of Libya um, to facilitate a settlement for the servicemen who had been killed and injured in Libya's bombing of the LaBelle discotheque in the 1980s. Um, for those of you who are not students of uh, the, the world of terrorism in the mid-1980s, um, Muammar Gaddafi uh, closed um, a large portion of the Mediterranean, claiming it as Libyan, and dared President Reagan to drive a carrier group a across what Gaddafi called the line of death. Um, Reagan drove, had that carrier group driven across the line of death. Gaddafi actually attacked that carrier group, which resulted in all of the attacking aircraft being downed um, you know, far away from that carrier group. There was never any real danger to any American uh, servicemen. And Gaddafi understood at that moment 
that he could not go head to head with US forces. So he, he, he began a, a pattern of conduct which um, is now called asymmetrical warfare. And the largest act of asymmetrical warfare that he engaged in against the United States uh, was the bombing of a nightclub in Berlin filled with off-duty US servicemen there. President Reagan responded by bombing Tripoli and Benghazi. Gaddafi then responded by downing Pan Am 103. And that's where the, the back and forth ended. So the first, as, as Gaddafi for his own reasons, was coming out of uh, 30 years, 20, 30 years of hibernation as a terrorist state, uh, he decided that he didn't want to litigate these cases, uh, principally Lockerbie uh, and the LaBelle discotheque bombing. And instead, we negotiated and settled. And um, at the time, if, if you don't count the US government officials that were going in and out, um, uh, denuclearizing, uh, Gaddafi, uh, I think I was the sixth or seventh American invited into Libya under Gaddafi as the normalization uh, process occurred. And it was really fascinating to be um, on the ground um, in a country where virtually no one had uh, ever met a US citizen. Libya had just been locked away that long. Wow. And, uh, you know, eventually we got a settlement worked out. That's how we, that's how we did it with the, uh, the Libyans. The Iranians are entirely different. Um, they do not enter the litigation. They do not contest the litigation. They do not settle. They force me to hunt and seize its assets in satisfaction of judgments. And when we seize the assets, then they enter and they defend their assets very vigorously. Um, we have had uh, two trips to the uh, two trips to the United States Supreme Court in the last three years um, with the government of Libya over seized. Um, I'm sorry, with the government of Iran over seized Iranian. Uh, assets. And we currently, we have separated, um, round numbers, we separated the Iranians from $1.9 billion of uh, real currency. And we currently have two major proceedings against the Iranians, one for around $1.8 billion. And the other one is a joint venture with the U.S. Attorney's Office in uh, New York, where we are working together to seize a Manhattan skyscraper called 650 Fifth Avenue. It's just off Rockefeller Plaza. And it was a building the Iranians were using to launder um, money through New York. You know, uh, there's a, a, an interesting and logical question asked, why would the Iranians move this kind of money through New York? I mean, why take that risk? And the answer is, if you look at their world, whether it is an illicit nuclear program or they're giving money to Hamas or Hezbollah to engage in terrorist attacks, those are dollar-driven transactions. Uh, Hezbollah is not interested in Iranian currency or Saudi currency or, or Swiss currency or Japanese currency. They want US dollar greenbacks and, and nothing else. So the Iranians have to take big risks to, to generate dollars. When I hunt the Iranians, my job is really to figure out where they're taking those risks and to find those, those pinch points and grab that money um, as it's traveling through the United States. Um, I'm sure we miss a lot. I mean, we've, we've grabbed, you know, as you can see, several billion dollars. But um, I, I, I suspect we've missed a lot. Um, interestingly, some of that the Treasury found and some of that the Treasury hadn't found. We gave them first notice of the, uh, uh, of the movement of Iranian money. 
So there, there's, there are countless ways that this money is being laundered, it sounds like. And once you seize, you seize it one way, there's, there's still so many, so many other avenues um, and channels. Does being officially listed as a state sponsor of terror by the United States make a difference one way or another in the difficulty of, of seizing assets, collecting money? Um, you know, in theory, it makes it easier. And, and we, we built a section of United States code that's all wrapped around enforcing judgments against terrorist states. That's the upside, and that's really good news. The downside is when a state is listed as a terrorist state, it understands it has to go underground. So it becomes a lot harder. Uh, it, it becomes a lot harder to find the money. So finding it is harder, seizing it once you found it is easier. How does, I think this is probably a question that, um, that a lot of people are, are wondering about. How does the recent normalization agreement between Israel and the UAE and Bahrain with other Arab states to potentially follow affect your work? I think I made, I don't know, three, four, five trips into the Gulf states last year. Um, I, you know, my ethnicity screams out wherever I go. I, I'm, I'm not in, I can't hide someplace in, uh, you know, in the Arab world. And, and uh, people were really um, very collegial, particularly in uh, Dubai. You know, I, uh, uh, it, and it's also a very safe place. Uh, so I can meet people there that whose home country I might not feel comfortable in, and I'm perfectly comfortable meeting in the Gulf. Um, you know, I I, I tell people this this um, uh, it's, it's just a little minute. I was in the Ritz Carlton in Dubai last year, uh, in the elevator, and the door opens, and um, an Emirati in, in his star, you know, really starched white Arab clothing gets on the, the elevator and he knows exactly what I am. And of course, I know exactly what he is. And we don't know what to say to each other. So we just face the front of the elevator and he starts humming. And I say to him, is that Beethoven's for Elise? And he goes, yes, it is. And I went, this is a great country. And he went, yes, it is. And then he got off the elevator. But, you know, it's, I mean, that's Dubai. It's, you know, it's very, very modern. Um, I walked into a high-end boutique uh, and there was an impeccably dressed, it was a very chic place. And, and there was an impe impeccably dressed Arab woman, you know, in her mid-20s, mid what you would expect to see in, in um, you know, working in a, in a woman's boutique. And I said to her, I need to buy the best traditional jet black burqa that you have for my Jewish American girlfriend. And she starts laughing and she looked me right in the eye and she said, sir, you are in the wrong country. If you want to buy a jet black burqa, go to the airport, get on an airplane and fly to Afghanistan. You're not going to find one of those things here. So, you know, I love the Emirates. I think it's a, I think it's a great place. I think it's a huge um, step forward. And I'm already hearing from uh, people I know in the Emirates, in the business community, they're going, Steve, do you know anybody in Israel we can talk to? Because we really want to get going on that, uh, on that business program. I think it's, a, it, you know, whether or not it, it helps me, I think it's tremendous for the state of Israel. I'm, I'm a, big supporter of what President, President Trump has done there. Great. Uh, we're about halfway through our questions. Um, so Jackie, when you can, you can please open the chat and people can start queuing up for their questions while we, we finish up with our Q&A. So 
So, so what, what, what you've been talking about, it sounds like you take on, it sounds to me like you take on a level of risk that goes well beyond what most attorneys do, seizing assets from dangerous people. Yes. Sorry, I, just, I was just muted. Okay. Can you share any pursuits which you feared for your life? Have you feared for your life? You know, that, that Don't I, brush it off. <laughs> you, you, you take risks. I, I, I take risks, you know. Um, there's a guy named uh, Bill Richardson. And Bill Richardson, is, he's a former governor. He's very well known for, for um, uh, doing American hostage rescue negotiations. And what's not well known about Bill is he's got a guy that works for him named, named Mickey Bergman, who's former Israeli special forces. And Mickey makes sure that everything works right for Governor Richardson when he goes abroad. I've got a guy who works for me uh, named Kevin McDonald. Kevin McDonald is a uh, retired Army Colonel, former US Special Forces. He stood the first unit of the Afghan Army up post 9-11. He commanded all the Navy SEALs and Delta Force guys uh, in Iraq. He was the fifth group commander. And I have a, a simple rule. If Colonel McDonald will get on the airplane with me and sit in the same room I'm sitting in. I'll go, you know, because he makes the arrangements. And um, I, with the exception of Israel, I don't go into the Middle East without him. I mean, we 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 fly as a as a duo. But you know, it it's in terms of real risk, and I I, it's not the expected stuff. It's the unexpected stuff, and I've never had any problem with with terrorists, um, you know, when I'm traveling abroad doing the work, but odd stuff comes up because some of the places you wind up going are nasty. And uh, I, I mean, and, and, I, and I'll give you a good example about fear, you know, fear and fear itself. Um, long time ago, I was in the Southwestern edge of the Sahara Desert and um, I wouldn't go there now. There's too many Boko Haram and Al Qaeda guys marauding around. Back then, you, you didn't have those kinds of problems. And I'm standing, I'm in a village and I'm standing next to a well looking out over the desert. And I see this guy um, riding in on the back of a donkey. And as he gets close to me, I can see that he's a leper and his nose is worn off and his fingers are all worn off. Uh, and he gets off his donkey and he walks up to me and he's holding, um, it's a dipper. And my obligation under Sharia law is to help, is to draw water and help him drink. And I know that you have to have a genetic predisposition to get, uh, leprosy is communicable, but you have to have a genetic predisposition. And if you get it and you live in the Western world, it's very easily dealt with. The medication is very effective and frankly inexpensive. Uh, and there was absolutely no reason for me to be afraid, but that disease is so ugly. I was scared to death. I was shaking like, like I mean, it was one of the few times in my career when my hands were actually uh, shaking when he got back on his donkey and and um, and rode off and it's little unexpected things like that um, th th that stay with you. It is not the day to day, you know, when when my colonel says this is evacuation plan number one, this is evacuation plan number two, this is evacuation plan number three. If something goes wrong, that stuff doesn't doesn't bother me. It's it's little stuff like. The you know the guy on the the guy on the donkey who you have to draw water for that stuff stays with you your whole life. So in that situation, um, I also want to get back to the to the protocols of 
um, evacuation plans mm -hmm. since you brought it up, but you, you had you 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 helped this leper because of following Sharia law. Mm -hmm. What what would happen if you didn't if you didn't help him? Nothing. The people I went to visit would just think I was an idiot, and that's not good for business. But um, but that's beside the point. If you go someplace, you know, I, 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 if you go somewhere, you have to honor local people's customs. You just can't be in the business of offending people. I mean, nobody would have stoned me. They just would have thought I was another American idiot. And I don't want to be just another American idiot. It's really important to do all those little things um, uh, when you go somewhere. Can you, OK, so these the, these evacuation plans that the, that the general goes over. Colonel, Colonel. The Colonel, the Colonel. I can an extra star. That's all right. <laughs> Um, so this is this happens whenever you have a, a meeting. In every scenario, you have a, a evacuation plans. We look. We if we are going someplace new, we are meeting new people. We don't know whether they're going to be friendly or unfriendly, or how unfriendly they're going to be. Stuff can happen, and you just you you're always safer if you plan ahead. It's okay if something goes wrong in the hotel you know the 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 first rally point is i don't know they don't have starbucks but actually some of those places have starbucks now it's the starbucks or the second rally point is the uh i don't know the camel barn down the street or the third rally point is but we we plan we stay safe by planning ahead and i will tell you it's a lot of planning and we've never executed a single one. But we do, we always plan ahead. Can you share with us the most surprising scenario or a few surprising scenarios of your career? Yeah. Um, they're always the stuff that you never see coming. Um, so, um, I'm in Tripoli. I am not getting along particularly well with a gentleman called the executive director. The executive director is, was the keeper of all the money that Gaddafi stole. And he was one of the people leading the negotiation for the, for the, um, Libyans. And, um, you know, when you negotiate with Arabs, it's like buying anything in the sook. You have to know when it's time to just up and leave for its effect on the negotiation. So I told him he had a beautiful, unspoiled country, and I wasn't prepared to put up with any of his crap anymore, and I was leaving. And he knows when my flight, I mean, there's no secrets there. He knows when my flight's, you know, departing, and I told him I was going to go sightseeing, which is what I did. And the next day, I was, I don't know. 150, 200 clicks out of Tripoli looking at a Roman ruin. And if this thing had been in Rome, it would have been cordoned off. But because it's in the desert a couple of hundred kilometers out of, out of Tripoli, I mean, you can walk around on this thing. You know, you can get down on your hands and knees, push the sand out of the way and look at the Roman tile. It, it, it's absolutely um, stunning. And uh, what happens is you show up in the morning uh, with your with your driver who's hauled, you know, your driver will haul you out from AAA and, and, um, uh, and, and then he, when he pulls into the parking lot, there are four or five local guys sitting there and, you know, one will speak German and one will speak French and one will speak English and you, you negotiate a price and you, you rent a tour guide for the day. And, um, he starts at the oldest part of this ruin. And by the time it's three or four o'clock in the afternoon, he turns to me and he said, this is the part you'll like the best because this is, you're an American, you're a Christian. 
And this part is from the Roman Christian era. So what do I say to him? And honestly, I wasn't about to die in the middle of the desert for the privilege of explaining that I was a nice Jewish American boy. I just saluted and said, yep, that's me, Joe Christian. And that's, you know, that's it. That's how I got through my little problem of the day. That's the kind of thing that you really worry about. Uh, you know, in, in a lot of, lot of places like that, um, okay, 200 kilometers out of Tripoli, a traffic accident that would have been a trip in an ambulance in, I don't know where everybody's from, it's called Miami or Orlando, is a death sentence there. What you really, what I used to worry about more than anything, it's just, you know, simple vehicular accident or getting sick, anything that would have been uh, routine. I, I think you're far too dramatic about the, about the, the risks I take. And, you know, you have these little incidents, like what do you do if somebody says you're, you know, you're Christian American? Do you, do you explain and take the risk or do you not explain? I chose not to explain. It was easier and he didn't mean any offense and I meant no offense by lying to him. It was just convenient. Okay, this is my, my last question and then we'll, we're gonna open it up to the audience. Um, do you, what are, the, what are the clever ways that you've found these assets um, that, that the example of this, this building in New York City is, is fascinating? Is there, does this involve a, a whole research team to uncover where these assets are? Yeah, it, it, it does. You know, uh, during one of my trips to Israel last year, I was drinking coffee on a purely social basis with the immediate head of the Mossad. And, you know, he'd done probably 40 years service uh, for Israel. And, and I said to him, uh, you know, you, you've watched the service change for 40 years what's the biggest difference between when you went in and when you came out? And he said, uh, when I went in, it was all about keeping secrets. There are no more secrets. Now we have so many data points, we don't know how to manage all of them. It's all about dealing with all the data points that you have. And, and I, think he's, I think he's very right. Uh, for us today, it's about data points. Um, you know, and, and, and we were going through some, uh, recently within the last month, for example, uh, and I'm not gonna tell you who the bank is because that'd be inappropriate at this point, but we were going through um, some leaked, let's call them leaked archives. And uh, one of my researchers uh, loaded up all this data, and then you got to figure out what do you match the data against. So we had thousands of accounts of different banks in the Arab world, and um, she matched it. My, my researcher matched that account those accounts uh, and, and ran the data analysis against the FBI's 10 most wanted list. And we got a hit. And one of those Arab banks is knowingly providing financial services for a female terrorist who was responsible for the Sabaro pizza bombing. Okay, nobody knew this till a month ago or at least nobody in the private sector knew that. And we may or may not commence some litigation against the bank. I'm trying to figure out whether activity this far after the fact, preventing the FBI from uh, uh, you know, grabbing this fugitive from justice is, is sufficient for the, for the uh, families of, the, of that attack to bring an action against the bank. That, that's a really interesting question but it was all about the quality of our data analytics. Um, we spend a lot of time and money on um, data analytics. Um, we also spend a lot of time and money on, on uh, uh, human intelligence. But I think one of the things that really makes us 
different uh, is the quality of our uh, an data analytics work. Um, uh, it, that's hard because not only do you have to get the data into a, in a searchable format, you have to know what questions to ask. And having people that work for you that know what questions to ask is not an easy thing to do. Um, I, I think in the future, data analytics is, is going to have a lot to do with how successful people are, not in winning uh, judgments against terrorist states or, or in hunting down the, these people, but in how successful you are in separating them from their, uh, from their money. Yeah, wow, absolutely. Okay, so we're going to turn it over to our, to our audience. Thank you so much. Steve, um, before I ask the first audience question, and while people are still typing their questions, I'm going to share some upcoming events, uh, which um, if one of my colleagues could also list in the chat, that would be great. Next Wednesday, September 30th at 1 p.m., we will have our ZOA book club, See No Evil, featuring author Joel Pollock. And on Thursday, October 1st at 7 p.m., The Failure of Jewish Leadership Today featuring our guest, Charles Jacobs. And the, the links, the registration link should be there too. So here is a, a question. This is actually a question more on the, on trials. If you work with any Israeli military, um, if any of them serve as witnesses on trials. We have used uh, people from the Israeli security services um, as expert witnesses. Um, in the Flato case that we talked about, for example, um, one of our key witnesses was the former director of intelligence from the Shin Bet. So, so the answer to that question is, is yes. We also use uh, you know, we talked about data analytics, collecting data uh, electronically and, and collecting data through human intelligence. Uh, we also use a lot of um, Israeli experts, former Israeli security services personnel in, uh, in that activity. Okay, we have a question. This is um, to comment on a recent BuzzFeed revelation um, to the extent of money laundering through the largest global banks and the failure of regulatory oversight. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know about it. Do, the, do you think this revelation will prove helpful for your efforts? It's not a revelation to me. Right. It's nothing new. I, you know, that's... It was for BuzzFeed. Every day. Every single day. Yeah, it, it, it is not a revelation. What is interesting uh, about the, the uh, disclosures it's these things that, that, that were, I don't know, either hacked or inadvertently disclosed are, are called uh, SARS, special, uh, um, Suspicious Activity Reports. Um, and banks turn these things in by the hundreds, thousands, and the Treasury never publicly discloses them and apparently doesn't act very often on them. Um, frankly, I'm, and I, this is not a comment directed at any presidential administration in particular. I, I, it's more a uniform comment. Um, I've been very critical of the, how should I put this in layman's terms, the lack of gusto, if you would, in the prosecution of um, money laundering entities. You know, there was a there was a big money laundering case that was prosecuted in New York four or five years ago that that settled. Um, it was against BNP Paribas, and the total fine paid to um, state and federal regulators was about. $9 billion. 
and nobody went to jail. Uh, and, you know, that sounds like a crushing amount of money. It didn't amount to a parking ticket for the amount of money that BNP Paribas laundered through the United States. And, and you know you, how you can tell that, that BNP Paribas got away with paying less than a parking ticket? The day after that $9 billion fine was announced, BNP Paribas shot, you know, stock price rose 10, 12, 14% on the public exchanges. That means the people inside the financial community understood how BNP Paribas, how much BNP Paribas really underpaid for the amount of money laundering that they had done. The reported money laundering in that case, I think, ran about $130 billion. A, a $9 billion fine for the movement of $130 billion of, uh, you know, Iranian and Cuban and Sudanese uh, uh, money through New York, it's inappropriately, inappropriately low. The, the revelation, if you want to call it that, the public revelation that the Treasury doesn't follow up on these things is, is not surprising to anybody inside the trade. And, and I think it's really unfortunate. The guy who I think had real backbone when he was doing that, that did a great job was Stuart Levy. And I, I don't know whether you know Stuart or not. Um, Stuart was appointed by um, President Bush. President Bush had Stuart over to the White House and he said, Stuart, you're in charge of illicit financial transactions at the Treasury. I am personally char charging you to use that position to destroy Iran's nuclear program. And he did very successfully. And uh, one of the reasons Barack Obama was able to negotiate the nuclear deal, which I'm not a big fan of, but you know, the, the reason he was able to get to that place was because of Stewart's work. And Stewart was the only Bush Treasury appointee that Obama held over. Well, actually, there's that. That's a good leading point to this question: whether you have run across any money that the Obama administration gave to Iran. <laughs> you mean can I steal? Can I steal it back? <laughs> I would love to, but I haven't found any of it. All right. So you'll just keep looking. I believe me, I'm looking. <laughs> um, okay, so there's a, so we have a question if any cases um, or if you're familiar with any cases or if you've been involved with any cases that have been brought on behalf of uh, victims, American victims of 9-11. Ah, okay. Um, I do not have any 9-11 cases. Uh, there are tens of thousands of 9-11 cases that are being uh, run through the court system in New York. Those cases are principally against Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, and the Sudan. I have not looked at the evidence in those cases. I don't know much about them, uh, how, how strong they are. The lead counsel in that case is... Um, a uh, good friend of mine named Jim Kreinler, when, uh, you know, we were talking about negotiating the settlement with Gaddafi for the LaBelle discotheque bombing. Uh, Jim was simultaneously doing the settlement with Gaddafi for the um, Lockerbie families. He's a good lawyer. He knows his craft. That was, uh, that was a question from our, our national, one of our national board members, Len Getz, who also happens to be my dad. <laughs> that he must be a good guy. Where's your dad? Where is he? Is he on? Yeah. I don't. Where are you? Uh, yeah, no, I'm yeah, in Philadelphia, where Shona, where Shona was born and grew up. <laughs> I think I think you've got. I think you too. Um. Okay. I think we we have time for uh, one or two more questions. Um. 
There was a question going back to when you were talking about um, Libya and the litigation, mm -hmm. uh, how, how you're able to do that. Well, at least today, given that it's just so unclear who's, who's in charge and what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate that I concluded all of my litigation with Libya before the Libyan civil war broke out. Um, it would be a very daunting task to try and do that um, today. Um, I am not a fan of Hillary Clinton's war on Muammar Gaddafi. You know, when I look at the aftermaths of these things, um, whether it's Syria or Libya, uh, I always ask myself the same question. In the context of Libya, is, it, is the average Libyan citizen better off because of the intercession of the United States and Western allies in Libya? And the answer to that question in, in Libya is no. Um, the answer to that question in the Sudan, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, in Syria is no. Um, the only country that I think has emerged better for its citizenry as a result of the Arab Spring and then the, the two wars that the United States uh, facilitated is Tunisia. And Tunisia's had a real Arab Spring. I mean, they're honestly, we'll see whether they make it, but they're really headed towards a democratic Arab state. Um, and uh, I think they just deserve a lot of credit for, for where they've taken their country over the last, uh, over the last few years. Okay, so this will be the last question. Um, I don't know if you're, if you're, you're able to answer it, but how do we penalize banks from money laundering? Or the money laundering? You mean how should we penalize? Not how do we, but how should how we? Could, yeah, how could, could we or should we? How should we? Look, um, what you saw from this FinCEN leak or data breach is a better way to describe it, is that major international banks are involved in money laundering. Um, and occasionally they get caught and occasionally they get prosecuted and the prosecution always winds up ending like this after several years of jockeying. The AUSA, the assistant United States attorney that has the case says, if you pay a fine in this amount, and agree to an anti-money laundering compliance program and a monitor, we won't put anybody in jail. That's, that is the model in the United States right now. And banks know this. They know at the end of the day, uh, they can buy good enough legal help in the United States that nobody's going to jail. Uh, BNP Paribas and others like it proved that their share prices are going to rise when they clean this up, that even these billion dollar fines uh, don't amount to a parking ticket given the amount of money that they're laundering. Uh, if we could make, if I could make one change, it would be to encourage U.S. attorneys around the country to Put a few people in jail. If you took officers and directors of major international banks and you sent them to jail in the United States, um, it would have a profound and, and very positive effect on uh, anti-money laundering compliance. Nobody goes to jail and, and the fines are inadequate. So, you know, banks go just to cost of doing business. There's no deterrent. 
just the cost of doing business realm. The best way to do that is to put people in jail. Okay, so you know what I said, that was the last question. I think we can squeeze in one more um, because it's, it's a good segue regarding funding of terrorists by NGOs and EU countries. Can you give, can you via legal action extend your prosecution to punish these parties? Um, Well, that's a great question. And a, that's the hardest question of the evening to answer. Um, by far the hardest question of the evening to answer. Um, NGOs aren't worth suing because they can't pay the damages. So what you do is you use litigation against NGOs to get at the financial institutions that are knowingly moving their money to terrorists. So what you've got to do is couple the NGOs and the banks uh, together in, um, in a piece of litigation under a statute called the Anti-Terrorist Act. And it's a very, very tough thing to do. Look, we had a we had a case uh, where um, how should I put this? We'll call it a Saudi NGO called the Saudi Committee uh, wanted to give ninety million dollars to, in fact, gave ninety million dollars to Hamas. Now they started out wanting to give that. They're Saudis. It's a little. It's a club. It's a committee. It's a club. It's you know, the Saudi version of an NGO. Uh, it's a group of wealthy, militant Saudi business actors, not the Saudi government, private actors. And they wanted to give $90 million in Saudi currency to Hamas to blow up Western targets in Israel during the Second Intifada. Uh, and Hamas said to them, Eek, are you kidding? At Saudi currency, we're not interested. You know, we may not like Americans, but we deal only in greenbacks. That's how we pay our bills. Dollars are fungible. We can do anything with them. We're not going to get caught. So you figure out how to convert your currency into dollars and make the donation to us in dollars, and then we'll go blow some things up for you. Um, and that happened. The bank that the Saudis chose and, and, and they chose it for political reasons, was a Palestinian-owned bank in Jordan called the Arab Bank of Jordan. And um, you, I think you know Gary Osen, whose office is in New Jersey. Uh, a whole bunch of us got together. Gary Osen was one of the lawyers. Mark Werbner, who's in Texas, was, was one of the lawyers. And we spent a long time, eight, nine years, litigating against the Arab bank. Um, at the end of the day, that case settled. I cannot tell you what the settlement was because it was sealed. I can tell you that the uh, New York Times reported that the settlement was a billion dollars. And let's just say plus or minus 10%, it's right. It doesn't matter. I can't, I can't talk about what the right number is, but let's say it's remotely accurate. Compare that, say, with the BNP Paribas case. In BNP Paribas, the government alleged that BNP Paribas laundered uh, $130 billion through New York, and they paid a $9 billion fine. In the Arab Bank case, two things happened assuming the New York Times report is accurate. It cost the bank a billion dollars for the privilege of laundering $90 million through New York, right? So it's a multiple of, not a fraction of. And we turned all of the evidence that we gathered in that case over to the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which regulates foreign banks in the United States, and the office of the comptroller of the currency promptly booted the bank out. They don't have an office in New York. They're gone. 
that's what should happen. Okay, you don't pay, you know, six cents on the dollar. You pay some multiple of what you laundered through the United States and you get booted out. That's effective anti-money laundering policy. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Stephen. We're already at eight o'clock and this was great. Thank you for everything that you do. It's truly an honor to call you a friend. Um, if we could just keep, keep, keep everyone on for another minute. I wanna reiterate that we at ZOA are a dedicated group. And if you're on this Zoom, I know you wanna help ensure that we're stronger than our enemies. Thank you to our current ZOA donors. Your financial contributions help make this possible. We have further to go and we have more that must be achieved. Please support us financially as much as you can. And on that end, please consider joining ZOA's Donor Society. This gives you access to exclusive briefings and opportunities in person when we're able and virtual with elected officials, Knesset members, members of the White House, ambassadors and others, but arguably the bigger benefit is how much more of an impact you have in expanding our crucial work. Donor Society membership starts at a thousand dollar donation or pledge for a calendar year and can be made in installments throughout the year. And you can learn more on our website, zoa.org. You can email me at florida at zoa.org. And thank you so much again, Steve, so gracious with your time and for everything you do. And I'll just end by thanking you all for joining us and by telling you again about um, our upcoming virtual programs, um, which are next week, September 30th, which is Wednesday, our book club at 1 p.m., See No Evil featuring Joel Pollack, and Thursday, October 1st, 7 p.m., The Failure of Jewish Leadership Today featuring Charles Jacobs. And thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us tonight.